Okay, so today we'll cover the visual sense of motion. And uh, as you can see here, uh, this is the cortex and along the side, and this is the inferior temporal sulcus. And if you follow it up towards the back of the head, uh, there's a place here called MT+. Plus. And um, that's perhaps the most important, most prominent area that's involved in the perception of motion. So we talked about areas in the uh, last week that were involved in object recognition. This Today we'll talk about this particular place and what it does. Um, now originally it was found in the monkey, this area, in something called the medial temporal gyrus uh, in the owl monkey. And uh, later in humans, it was identified instead, as I mentioned here, in the, in the inferior temporal sulcus. So you may wonder why MT isn't called like IT or something like that. But that's just because of habit. Um, this place was named MT, and we stuck to it for uh, no good reason. Now, what, ha what, what does this area do? Um, so th this area, again, is, it specialized in detecting motion, uh, all kinds of aspects of motion. And it allows you to uh, uh, perceive automatically that things are moving or not and what speeds. Uh, if you didn't have this area, the world would seem like this. So you can imagine when you're crossing the street, um, it'd be hard to tell uh, whether the cars are stopped at the, at the intersection or moving, and if moving, how fast and in what direction. When you're pouring yourself a cup of coffee, um, you would have trouble seeing how fast the, 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 the fluid was rising in the cup and tend to overfill it. And there's a variety of other things that we use visual sense of motion in everyday life that you'd have trouble with. Now, if you just had MT plus, um, and not areas in the ventral stream um, that evolve in, in object recognition. This is what you'd see the world as. Okay, um, You could see that there's objects moving, but you'd have trouble telling that they were cars, and you would see them in sort of black and white, because this area first has these big receptor fields, so it can't see in detail. And secondly, doesn't have any color sensitive information. So what what happens is that this area MT plus feeds into our watch stream and provides us so that we can see the combination of what MT is seeing and sending to the brain and um, uh, what the what stream is seeing, and together we perceive um, the world in a vivid motion. Now, where does MT get it, get it, its input? We saw that uh, in, in the earlier lectures on V1 that over here you have the right eye input, and over here you have left eye input. And in layer 4C, you have just one eye or the other eye. And then as you go up to higher layers, you see uh, uh, binocular cells, um, that, that's, and they're in these uh, wedges that see different orientations. So you see um, the edges or form of the object, and some of the signal goes to these blobs that the double opponent cells 
that allow you to perceive colors. And both these things see in high acuity. Uh, the, 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 the signal that goes to MT comes from an, another area, from layer 4C, we send signals to layer 4B. And again, uh, these look much like the simple cells that we saw before, but um, they, they, they're largely from the, the magnocellular part of your visual field, and so they don't see in, in, uh, in, in much detail. And this signal then goes directly to MT, and also through the area, indirectly, through areas V1, V2, not V1, but V2, V3, um, to MT. So the two paths. That was loud? Okay. Uh, what you saw there, and I can play it again for stunning. Um, you saw this neuron being fired, and it was fired because this signal, this signal, and all these signals arrived here at the same time, and so you got the neuron firing above threshold. When this neuron fires, it says, okay, there's motion. Um, and the reason it fires is because this afferent that was excited here uh, has the longest connection to this neuron. Now this is a cir now if you instead you went in the opposite direction, <coughs> these neurons this neuron won't fire because this one arrives first and this one will rise last, but not at the same time. So this neuron is sensitive to motion at this particular speed and in this particular direction. Now we find neurons like this um, in, in birds, not in humans. But we find a similar circuit through more, a more elaborate connection in our V1. Now what do these neurons do? Well, you can see here that uh, um, these, this li these lines seem to be moving in different directions. Okay, but then if I do this, I can show you what, 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 uh, what the line is actually doing. And here, yes, it is moving in back and forth horizontally. But if I look at this line, which move, seems to be moving diagonally, you find that it's not. Okay. It's actually moving again horizontally. And this line, which is moving diagonally, but down, up and down, is also moving back and forth. So why do we perceive these directions as different? Well, one reason is that these cells that look at these lines also have these sort of receptive fields that somewhat resemble the circle here. And they can't tell what direction that line is um, from just uh, this, because uh, you could have, as we just saw, lines moving in any of these directions and still cause this appearance. So the, the brain cells uh, decide, well, we're going to make our best guess. In this case, the best guess is perpendicular to the line. And so this good guess, you can see here that what, what a circuit looks like in humans, you have these cells that measure, get activated by lines of particular orientation, the simple cells in your V1, and they all feed this complex cell. And when these lines are of the same orientation and going this particular direction, they will light up the simple cell. 
Okay. It's complex cell. But there's always a but. Okay. So we can say this this line here seems to switch the direction. It's moving down now and horizontally now. Down horizontally. What's what's happening here? Well, if we look at what, what's underneath, it's actually a line going in the same direction. But we are, we're something, somehow, somehow making a different assumption about it. And what we're doing here is basically this. But when we see a real line, okay, we, we sort of say, okay, that's the line, and that's the end of the line. And when we see this, we can do the assumption that it's moving perpendicular, but at the same time, we're assuming the line, line's ends are over here at, at the two edges of, of this imagined line. Well, over here, what we're doing is imagining this line having ends along these borders here. Okay, I have to. And, and the, the edges of these borders change depending on whether it's going along here or along here. So it's assuming the ends occur at particular points. So the, 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 the system is treating things like objects and in some ways. Now, where does the percep your perception of motion occur? We said, okay, uh, MT is very important, or MT plus. And here we have, we'll see, we'll do an experiment where we're re recording from a cell in V1 and in MT, and we'll try to, um, to figure out how to tell whether it's in V1 that you have this perception of motion, or does it occur higher up in area MT? Well, if let's say we're looking at this pattern here, your eyes, suppose this, this pattern here. In this case, the line is moving horizontally. What if we switch to a line moving vertically or, or, or diagonally, I should say? Nothing happens. The cell doesn't like this line or this line, but it likes this line. No, I can't feel like that turns it off. <laughs> Anyways, so it likes that line. A line moving down and to the right. Now we find another cell in MT. And what direction does it like? Well, it doesn't like moving up to the right. It doesn't like moving horizontally. Surprise, it likes the same direction. So that's not a good test of determining which which location is where 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 we have perception of the line, of the uh, of the image because the both both cells fired from the same line and we can't distinguish between the two. But let's look at this pattern for a moment. And if you look at this pattern, these lines are moving down to the right. These lines are moving up to the right. But when we have both of them, the thing seems to be moving just to the right. The lines are still there, okay? These two sets of lines stay the same. One, one set is moving up to the right, and the other set is moving down to the right. But you perceive somewhere in the brain that things are going to the right, the, the combination of the two. So this is a, perhaps a good, a better pattern to use to test our cell. Remember our cells, we have this, the same direction of motion, both in MT and in V1. So, huh, we'll do this fast. Okay, this cell, this direction activates V1, not MT. Okay, why is that? Well, this is moving horizontally, and 
and so the, the, this perception is horizontal, but it's made up of a line that's moving this way and this way. And this direction is what lights up the V1 cell. If we switch the direction to here, we still get the perception, the, the activation of the V1 cell. Now we have a line moving this way, another line moving this way. The perception is down. Down is not a direction this cell likes. So we finally get this guy. Okay, now it activates the cell. And the reason it activated the cell was because um, the, in that pattern, it was the perception that mattered, not the, uh, um, the, the direction it was moving. So what actually was happening on the retina was irrelevant. It was the perception that mattered, and the perception is what lit up MT and not V1. So we know then that MT is the area that you perceive motion with. The other thing about MT, I'm glad I turned down the volume on the animation here. I'll have to make sure I do that for next year's class. Um, is that uh, it also depends on attention. So let's suppose we're, we're asked to attend this mo the motion of this dot here. When we attend motion of this green dot here, we find that the cell fires every time that, that dot moves upward. Now we show, show two dots, and we say, okay, keep your eye on the dot, on the blue dot. When we do that, so remember, the, the, before it was the green dot that, that did the activation. So when the blue dot moves up, okay, it causes a fire. When we switch our direction to the green dot, it causes it to fire, and not the blue dot. So depending on which one of these we pay attention to, it is the one that causes activation in this area. So this area needs two things. One is you have to have um, a, something moving in the direction of the cell that you're recording, plus your, your cortex has to be attending to that direction. Okay, what happens in MT? MT is a bit like um, V1 in that it has these columns. And you can imagine each of these columns represents the activity from a little patch of retina. So again, it has this retinotopic um, representation. If we take one of these little columns and look at it in higher magnification, we see that column is made up of many mini columns. Now, each of these mini columns uh, has a motion of a particular direction that it's most sensitive to. This, this is something in this direction. Every cell here is in this direction. Every cell here is in upward direction. Okay, so you can see the direction varies from mini column to mini column. Also, there's different colors here. What, what, what these colors represent is depth, okay? Sometimes you see things farther and sometimes you see things nearer. So not only is, are the mini columns representing different directions, they're also um, representing different directions and depths. Furthermore, if within these mini columns, you find many different cells, each of which represent different speeds. So some cells uh, are, are wired to 
uh, fire best for slow speeds. Other cells are fired to uh, go for quick things that are moving. And that, so you realize that something is moving quickly, not by how quickly it's moving, but just because one of these cells is wired up to be activated by something quickly. So just that this cell is firing drives your perception that something's moving fast. Another, when another cell fires, that, that tells you that something's moving slow. Its firing rate becomes irrelevant. Okay, so then we saw what MT, but we, we're looking at an area called MT plus. MT plus is made up of additional areas, and these are MSTL for lateral and MSTD for dorsal. What do these two areas do? Well, MSTL, the lateral one, is interested in sm tracking small objects. Okay, um, so it's activated by relatively small parts of the the the, the retina, and it's also involved in pursuit move, eye movement. So when I m track my finger moving back and forth in front of me, or when you follow um, a basketball uh, in, in, in the gym or a tennis ball in the court, um, your eyes are respond, your eyes see, activate, uh, are activated by the small object and you elicit activity in this area. And in turn, you can follow that object because it drives these movements. The other area, MSTD for dorsal, is involved with things moving everywhere in your visual field, okay? So when you're driving down the highway, like here, um, you see things approaching you, and that activates MSTD, um, and that in turn, again, gives you the perception of how fast and in what direction you're moving. Now, what's, import, what's more also important about MSTD is that it's activated by both your left and right visual fields. So remember, V1 was always contralateral. LOC was also contralateral. Um, and, but MSTD is bilateral, so it receives information from uh, the 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 uh, V1 on the left and V1 on the right, and the one that's the opposite crosses along the corpus callosum to feed these cells. The other places that this occurs is when you had your fusiform face area cell. It was activated by a face, no matter where it was in your visual field. So a little to the left of the Fovea a little bit to the right of the fovea would still activate uh, the same uh, uh, fusiform face area cell. The same, now, the reason you need um, to have input from both the left and the right visual field is because you want to figure out what direction is of direction of things are moving. And this area also elicits a false direction of movement. You, um, if you're stopped in front of a car uh, and it, the car in front of you starts to move, you often feel that you're rolling backwards. Or if you're in a subway car and the subway train uh, crosses from you and the other track starts to move, again, you have this false sense of movement. So this is because you elicit this, these MSTD cells. Now, if you're looking to the right, if you turn to the right, you'll see this. You'll see the whole image sweep across in the opposite direction. If you turn left, you see this. So you're giving this, this, this pattern of movement across the eye. When you move forward, you see something expanding. When you move backwards, you see everything contracting. And then you can tilt your head this way or this way. And in each case, get a different pattern on the whole retina. 
And from this, these patterns, you can tell exactly what direction you are moving in. So when you drive in a car and you see things moving up to the right or um, over to the right, you know you're turning to the right. Now again, MSTD is organized into columns. In each of these little directions, this is represented by a different column of neurons. So again, uh, what direction you're going in lights up that particular column. And it's when these cells fire that you know you're going that particular direction. Okay, you look at this image here. This image here and this image here are very similar. But this one is a picture from, of my wife's garden in the back. And you can see here that you can tell its 3D shape. You know the purple flowers are up close to you and the yellow flowers are more behind. So this motion here um, gives you this 3D shape. Now this has nothing to do with what we saw before about 3D shapes, the, 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 the image from both eyes, the difference between the image of both eyes. You can tell that by closing one eye and you still see the 3D shape. Okay, So it doesn't depend on binocular vision, nothing to do with those binocular cells we saw earlier. Now the reason for that is that the disparity between the two eyes gets smaller and smaller the further the object is away. And eventually beyond the boat, the, an arm's length, the disparity gets so small that the difference between the two eyes are, are so small that it's hard to tell depth from that. So the brain starts to use then this other cue called motion parallax. If you're um, at home looking through a window, if you just bob your head back and forth, you'll see the same uh, motion parallax. The edge of the window will be moving back and forth quickly, whereas the objects farther in the distance won't move at all. You can see why that's the case here. Okay, There are two objects here in front of the eye. The eye is still always turn forward and you can see that the closer one sweeps across the retina faster um, and the farther one sweeps slower. The red one is the one that's farther. It's moving back and forth a much smaller distance. Eventually, at, in, at a, you know, looking at the horizon, it'd be moving almost not at all. So it's that measurement of how fast things are moving on one eye over time, across time, by comparing one picture to another picture, that the brain decides how fast things are moving. Now, one added difficulty is that we can end up tracking uh, whatever we're looking at. Again, these pursuit movements that I talked about, elicited by MSTL. So if we're looking here, we're looking at the near object. We're looking at the, the purple flower. Well, if we're looking at that purple flower, it'll be moving very little on the retina. This blue outline here is supposed to be what the retina sees. But you can see that this farther up, the yellow flowers are moving a lot on the retina. Now, that's what we normally see, far objects move more. But if we instead we looked at the yellow flower, its image would be, become more stationary on the retina. And, uh, and now the opposite occurs for the, for the, for the, the near flower. You can see it sweeps a lot across the retina. So again, we can see this happening here. Here we're looking, the eye is always turned to the near object, the square, the green square, 
And again, it, the back of the retina, the fovea, is indicated by this yellow bar. And you can see that the green object doesn't move, but the red object does. Now, if the eye points always to the far object, it's the green squares that move on the back of the retina. Okay. So the brain has to take into account how much the eye is moving in order to make its decisions. And that's an important question. And how it does this is, um, uh, we'll see in a moment. So you can see here that the object moves or the eye moves. In both cases, um, you, the, the, the retina sees the same thing happening. Um, and that's an important thing to distinguish, especially if that thing is a lion. Now, how, to, how it does this was um, something that uh, a fellow called Hemholtz, who was both a physician and a physicist, um, discovered or um, uh, came up with. And he said that we distinguish how, what this happens by using two things. First of all, we, the, the brain measures, can measure how fast things are moving across the retina by all those things we talked about on the, the previous part of this lecture. We can measure retinal slip motion on the retina. So that generates one signal. The other thing the brain can know is it sends a command to turn the eyes. So it knows that what that command is. And he can tell by a copy of that command what it's, it is. And the brain then compares these two things. And as a result of this comparison, comes up with the perception of how things are moving. And this signal here is called the Crowley discharge. So we can see here that if the image slips in the opposite direction of our eye movements, we attribute the motion, the, the motion on the retina to that of the eye, not of the object. So here we see an image slipping to the left, and here we see an eye movement to the right. And when that happens, the two cancel, and our perception is that the image, in this case the lion, is still. Okay. And there'll be lots of practice problems to figure out, practices on other things as well, other combinations. The other thing is that it's not only that eyes that are moving can generate this uh, quality discharge, but you can rotate your heads or you can be moving forward in the scene. All these things, motion of yourself, will generate a movement command, and a copy of it will be the crawler discharge. And the brain can compare what happens on the eye with that crawler discharge instead, and determine whether the lion's approaching you or you're moving towards the lion. Okay. The other interesting thing is the mo a motion after effect. Now, I want you all to stare at the center of this thing while it starts to rotate. Okay. And keep your eyes still on that very center. What happened to the face? Yeah, getting bigger. Okay, we'll try that again. And this time, when it stops, look at your friend's face. <laughs> stare, 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 stare. Thank <laughs> you.
Okay. Why is that happening? Okay. Well, one 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 misinterpretation is because your your cells get tired of firing, and and that's uh, that causes the adaptation. Um, but that's not the case. Cells don't tire. The the, the in some the, in some cases the the CNS is designed to adapt on purpose because it's not interested in things that are constant. So one theory is that it is. Um, it adapts because things are the same and so there's no need to expend energy. But the other possibility is that, remember we had these cells in, in MT, each sensitive to different directions and different speeds of motion. Well, you can imagine you have different cells firing for different speeds and they are arranged into a scale. So this, this is fast movements in this direction. These are fast move, movements in the other direction. And these are slow movements. Okay. So let's, let's see what happens if you start st stimulating cells around here at a constant velocity. Well, the theory is that when something constant appears, these cells around the same velocity are recalibrated. And they're, they're recalibrated to sense these speeds or speeds around this constant speed. And they do so so that you can tell with more accuracy if there's a change in speed around that speed. Your, your brain is recalibrating itself. But in doing so, the, this happens, okay? Suppose you have a cell here that senses motion in the opposite direction, okay? When we view something moving at the same speed, it gets drawn in, okay? And when it stops, this cell here that detected motion in the opposite direction now gets stimulated by the stop speed. And it, when it gets activated, you sense that it's, things are moving in what you pre it previously uh, coded for, and that was something moving in the slowly in the opposite direction. So uh, the, the, the cell speeds are being recalibrated, and cells that are close to the speed that you're traveling at uh, get drawn in to become more accurate around that speed, cells that are farther away get drawn out and as a consequence they produce this after effect. Okay, what's interesting about this? What, what do you see here? Somebody tell me? Or what do you think that might be interesting about what you see here? Any suggestions? Moving lines, yes. A moving lion, sorry. Yes, a moving lion. But not it's not always moving and and so it's a moving lion and but all there is is these tiny little uh, lines and it's a uniform field of those tiny little lines. How do you tell it's a lion? Okay, it's motion, but uh, the watch stream in on its own, can it tell motion? No, right. The, 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 the watch stream on its own can't tell motion. So what, what's happening? Anyone care to suggest what, what might be happening? Or, or the other way around, maybe MT is telling the what stream what lines to bind together. Remember that MT was trying to uh, uh, say, okay, this line belongs to the foreground by, you know, extending little bits of it and combining them together. 
So MT is doing its best to figure out which lines belong to the object, which lines belong to the uh, background, and in doing so, it allows you to see the objects. But in this case, um, it itself can't tell motion, so it receives the signal from MT. Okay. So MT is feeding it. As a consequence, you see these objects. Okay, here you see something different. Okay, what do you see here? Yes? Moving white square. Okay, that's, well, I think, now, when you see each square, how is it that you see each square? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's really not a not really a square there in the first place. It's just uh, little bits missing from from the um, circles and little bits missing from the lines. Okay, uh, so you're again. It was the the, the interpolation between the 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 brain was making up the fact that there's a square there on one side and a square there on the other side from these um, uh, cells that were interpreting between ed lines, the ends of lines, those end stop cells that we talked about. And these are all feeding uh, the what stream. So the what stream is coming up with this, this square on one side and the square on the other. But the fact that, that it disappears and appears again is what's driving MT. MT, remember, is the area that's involved in your perception of motion. Okay. It must be getting its signal from your V1, uh, from LOC in this case. LOC is telling you that there's an object on the right, and then, and then it's gone, and then another object on the left, and then it's gone. It must be have moved, and as a consequence, uh, sends a signal to MT, and you perceive the sense of motion. Okay, so the two areas, MT and LOC, are cooperating and sharing information. Okay. Now, I'll sh what's, what do you think this might be? A what? Man froze in place rotating. Okay. Uh, or uh, the statue of a man. Fro yeah. So it, it's, it's something that's not moving. It could be a man that's frozen. Or it could be a statue. What, what's this instead? Okay, is it a statue? No, it's probably a man. Okay, so uh, so you can see that the all the all the brain actually sees is these lines. Okay, in this case, these lines are changing their location, but the brain figures out that there's a three D shape up to it. And it decides that it's a statue or something frozen. Here it sees also uh, a bunch of lines, but they're moving. And it decides that, uh, that this thing is an object that, or a human, uh, uh, something living that's moving. And this is called biological motion. The brain comes up with these decision. So first of all, it combines these images and creates a, a 3D structure. And secondly, because these joints are, it comes up with this, this 3D structure, but here the, 
the different parts of this region are, are changing the, their relative location. So the arms and legs are moving relative to each other. So it's getting this image of these arms and legs moving. And from that it's like, okay, this must be, must be a living object. The same thing happens when, when it, it, this, it, this biologic motion is also used for something called lip reading. When you look at person mouth moving, a lot of times you can tell what the person's saying, or it helps you tell what the person's saying from watching his mouth. Now the area that's involved in doing all this is something called the superior temporal sulcus. And this area here gets information both from LOC, because it gets all these lines and combines them into objects, gets information from MT, which feeds LOC and allows it to group which lines belong, if it was a com more complicated thing, which lines belong to the object, which lines belong to the background, and sends those two pieces of information to this area, and that decides uh, uh, what, what, the, what it is that you're seeing. And you can tell a lot from these moving objects. I'll show you in a minute how much. So, just to summarize, we have, we, we've, previously we talked about a what and a where stream. We've got something here, MT, which has similar things to both. Uh, MT, um, we saw, it gets information primarily from these um, magnocellular parts of, 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 of um, the lateral genetic nucleus. And that is typically similar to the what's or where stream, as opposed to the um, parts that get it from the fovea and go to the inferior temporal sulcus. So it, 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 in, some case, in some ways it's, it's part of the wear street because of this thing, but many people think that it, it could be uh, considered a when street because it's, it, time is an important thing in this, for this area. Things over, happen over time. Okay, let me just bounce to this for a moment. Okay, so you can tell that from these little dots that there's a, a human moving. Okay? It's a human structure. Okay, let's, let's see what happens when we change this. Okay, you can tell what what, what what's the likely whether it's a female or a male we can tell whether it's a heavy person or a light person we can tell whether it's a nervous person or a relaxed person and whether a person happy or sad <laughs> so it's amazing from what a few little dots, what the brain can tell about what it sees. Thank you very much.